Do you want to keep do you want to keep the chat game related or are the other random topics fine with you? Any any topics fine. I'll end up connecting it back to what we're doing most of the time, you know? I don't think any topic is random enough for me to not connect it back. <laughs> Well, you're perfectly welcome to uh, introduce new topics or lead the conversation somewhere while I uh, start to uh, decline in the BPMs. Latvian, I see. What is the state of Latvia? How do you feel about your country's progress at the moment? Tell me something interesting about Latvia. We have a declining population, lack of modern infrastructure for many sectors, lack of international recognition, but I like living here. Wow, you threw a curveball there. Um, that's kind of lovely that um, I believe I am more inclined to believe someone who likes something and is very well, uh, very candid about the things that aren't so bright. It demonstrates to me that you clearly have lived in a country and really experienced all that it had willing to accept the you know the trade-offs and the pros and cons of living in the country now here's a challenge for you or out of my curiosity what does it have so can you name three things to balance out the three uh not so desirable qualities that you've mentioned so what makes you like living there declining population huh it's a very uh it's actually a very it's becoming more and more common to have specific countries have declining populations um case in point right a very relevant country that is relevant to OS, people who are interested in OS, is Japan. Japan also has a declining population, for example. I think largely, I would say, the out, from an outsider perspective, Japan does have modern infrastructure. However, we have to keep in mind that the modernization that we are aware of in Japan are underrepresenting the rest of Japan. A lot of Japan is largely uh, countryside, agricultural stuff. So you could see that if you lived in Japan as well. Where I live, there is technically the area that I live in the United States is lacking in modern infrastructure for, for certain. However, it is also the suburbs and the countryside. 
Uh, international recognition, that I cannot empathize with because I do live in the United States, that's for sure. I could try to empathize with you about international recognition, though, because I am an Asian American, and Asian Americans represent less than 10% of the United States. So in terms of the international recognition of the type of American I am, I can definitely, that's the closest feeling. I could have resonating with that. Obviously, the United States is a very large country and it's populated by an incredibly diverse group, me of which is a representative of one of the minorities. In terms of declining population, I think as far as I know, the United States population uh, growth is uh, not on the uptrend, but on the downtrend. And it's a very common, um, it's a thing that coincides and is associated with developed countries that tend to have modernized to a point where um, having children has become, it's a really big deep cut, but uh, throw out some hot takes. Uh, financial sustainability, um, pragmatic, pragmatic approach to like career and sustainability, um, the risk and like, pros and cons of having children and then the different paradigm shifts and emphasizing career and like lifestyle choices over having children, uh, relational decline in re relational status, later and later relationships. There are a lot of things that are swirling around developed countries. I'm speaking for the United States, I suppose, in a way that ultimately all contribute to a declining population. This is more in my opinion. I think the capital and other places are surprisingly beautiful, which could be good for tourism. That sounds excellent. Do they have tourism? Is the capital a, a place of tourism? I, I find capital cities absolutely amazing. I, I, don't get a, I don't get out a lot or travel a lot. However, when the opportunity presents, visiting capitals is a, it's a great because generally speaking, they serve as a purpose and they also serve the intent and purpose of representing a country, right? In, in a smaller format. So like when you visit a country, typically the capitals are where you want to at least stop by or the major, major uh, cultural hubs in the country. Like if you go to Japan, Tokyo, right? If you go to the United States, you're probably thinking New York City. Even though it might not represent the entire, like, you know, entire extent of the country, especially speaking from the United States, it's a cultural hub. So I, I absolutely believe you when you say your capital is beautiful and it's a great place for tourism. Since the cost of living in Latvia isn't that high, if you create a business that's somewhat successful, you'll be well off. Oh, that's interesting. Can't think of a third one for now. That's fair enough. Do you have a business or do you plan on opening a business? It's a very specific example. So I'm curious if you're a business, uh, you're a uh, prospective entrepreneur. All the things you said about declining volume can apply to Latvia. Yeah, that's, uh, it, it hits pretty hard when it comes to, uh, I, I generally, listed the ones that uh the factors that are more or less internationally felt when it comes to declining population because remember that we have to keep in mind that sustaining a population it's like a chicken or the egg thing sustaining population growth also requires those things and then those things decline in those things also causes decline so it's like back and forth they're both like they feed on each other, all those things. So if someone is seeing or observing a visible decline in the population, it's back and forth between those factors. You don't, but your parents own a business, I see. Business administration, huh? Well, lots of the factors that you listed that uh, show up to you, you know, become apparent to you about your own country, and then a lot of the factors that... I mentioned 
Yeah, that's that's definitely something business a business administrator would probably keep tabs on, right? I'm not. I don't have a background in business per se or in administration. They're kind of actually two uh, very big disciplines. Uh, generally speaking, though, when you reach a level of education, you're required to kind of know a little of everything, right? And understanding business practices and how to like appeal to organizations for funding is a thing. And administration, when you become a person who's leading a project or something, you have to have a lot of specific specific skills involved in administration duties like human resource related administration stuff otherwise it's going to be very difficult for you to run something <laughs> what is the os scene like and the league of legends scene like in latvia while i'm Continuing to do this. League scene is just people playing for fun. I see no pro players or popular streamers, but a lot of people play it. Fair enough. For OS, it's the same, but with the exception that the rank two. That's true. Yes. Uh, Akalabi, Akalabid. I don't really know how to pronounce the person, the the user's handle. What is my goal for the thirty days of uh retapping training? Huh. Uh, being able to play all kind of BPMs, being more consistent. That's a good question. Um, well, I can tell you uh, what inspired the retraining. So the the inspiration for this training is that I'm switching my middle my middle finger to my ring finger. So this is the first time in the last twenty the last twenty three days that I've used my middle finger as the I mean that I've used my ring finger as the alternating finger and not my middle finger. So for on and off for the first three or four years of O's, it has been my middle finger and my pointer finger. So that's the inspiration. Uh, all that other stuff about being able to play all BPM streams and being consistent, I, I think those are bonuses, for sure. 
Um, here's the longer, slightly open-ended version. Uh, I wanted to do... Is there a reason why we uh, swapped? Uh, curiosity. I wanted to do something different. Uh, the main motivation... So the main goal is to do something different. That's all. So the very open-ended, long story short is that I want to do something different. Uh, typically my goal is to learn something. Uh, the reason why I make videos and I stream and I talk about things and I record myself doing things is to illustrate the learning process. And that's it. So what becomes of it is difficult to know until I'm actually done with doing it. So at the end of 31 days, I will have a closing remark and I'll try to summarize all the things that I've discovered along the way about the learning process for myself and then perhaps anybody else who find any of the things relevant. So the ultimate goal, the initial inspiration is to do something different and learn as much as I can with it. So it's a... Uh, the closest thing I would say to representing what this is, is uh, empirical testing. So there was a time when basic science is a thing, right? And basic science involves observing something and then just doing it and collecting the data. Then afterwards, you find out what you learn from it as you're collecting the data. So that's kind of the act of practicing how to learn things as opposed to having goal-oriented practice. So, oftentimes, uh, there's plenty of that. So, like, um, if you go online, go on YouTube, the algorithm will definitely uh, provide very influential and great people by the great content creators that will show you what the end result is and how they achieve the end result. Unfortunately, I can't actually tell you what my end result is until it actually happens. Along the way, I'll be collecting and making observations to myself like, Oh yeah, today, this feels a little interesting, that feels a little interesting. And then near the end, I will look and reflect upon all of it. And then I'll see what I gather from it. Yeah. It doesn't really answer your question, but that's how I go about doing it. It makes you miss statistical courses? Yeah. So, uh, since you're in business administration and then you have, it seems like you have on the idea of statistical courses, the idea is like, um, we live in an age where you play games and you play things with a closed system, right? It's a rating system that provides metrics for you. And that metric governs and restricts how you produce results. Those results are governed towards those metrics. For me, the most interesting thing is to do something that doesn't have a metric yet. And what I'm doing is empirically collecting that data and then and, and then thinking about it afterwards. It doesn't have to be literal data collection, although OS has a wonderful tool to like collect all this data anyways. Um, and I do that just to like mix it up because the whole goal is to figure out something new, experience something new that allows me to discuss it with other people. Like I can't just simply farm data from other people if I don't have that privileged access. So I use myself as an example most of the time. So I'm doing this just to collect a bunch of data. Like how long it takes me to do something, in 31 days, what can I achieve? Uh, switching fingers and the structure that I had. So all this is collected empirically without a goal in mind, without hypothesis-driven testing, which a lot of times uh, there's plenty of that. 
on YouTube, on Twitch, actually just the act of being online, you are hypothesis testing, which is not the scientific method, right? It's uh, not the scientific method, by the way. The very first step of the scientific method, often that's skipped, is null hypothesis testing. However, no one really does that either. So, and the whole empirical random sampling stuff, that's, that's kind of by the wayside as well. So I do that for fun. I do that to attract attention because, uh, generally speaking, uh, when you're creating content, it has to stick out, right? And it also has to be expandable. This is not, a, this is not scalable. Like the, the approach that I'm taking is not scalable. However, it's something that no one asks for. And that's usually how... I'm a, I used to be a scientist, right? That's usually what's interesting about science. You're asking questions and answering questions and finding more questions that no one asked for. That's the discovery process. So I'm here to discover things, not iterate on things that already exist. So, no, I'm not going to be able to tell you how to get better, how to get more PP. I can explain to you what the PP system does, and you probably already know this detail. That's not the interesting part. The interesting part is how do you feel and interpret and achieve the learning process necessary for you to get PP? I want to hear that. Because I don't do that. It's less interesting to me. But I want to hear your journey on your interpretations and psychological impact of having a PP system dictate your value as a gamer. And the reason why I talk about this while talking about games is generally if you're a young person who's learning to become a professional in some career that involves out-of-the-box thinking or problem-solving critical thinking, video games tend to make you think a certain way that isn't that. So balancing the two types of approaches is very important to make yourself a well-rounded person. Um, video games tend to remove the constraints of needing to figure out what else could it be. Like, how else can you solve your problems? How else can you discover something new? When you're playing video games, you could do that too. Just most people don't have to. Because video games define goals for you. They define... So in terms of how this is relevant is that if I'm a content creator and those who watch content are inspired by content and want to make content, right? The most successful application or most consistent application of being a content creator is creativity. And creativity requires that you practice skills that involves empirical testing or just doing stuff empirically and then reflecting upon it. You can take inspiration and lots of standardizations that are available on YouTube, but you can't see what you aren't given, right? And you can't create new things if you think based on what is fed to you. So it's, it's multifaceted. I just use video games as a platform to exchange those ideas. And I believe that video games in the future can be a vehicle and key to helping youth or people growing up to have the necessary critical thinking for uh, sustainable lifestyles, like solving coping mechanisms and improving communication. All these things are not emphasized right now in video games. However, now video games are becoming a lifestyle. So if they are consuming more and more of your active, conscious life, they can they become more influential part of conditioning all the ways you think. So for example, Os is a great 
way to illustrate this point. When someone feels like they can't play another game anymore because they spent way too long on hosts. That is a critical indicator of someone who is confined to having thinking, like have their thinking a certain way. Um, and in order to circumvent that or overcome some of that stuff, it requires an inspiration of leaving the box. And that's kind of what happens when you play a lot of games that are ranked, right? Well, you play League of Legends. You'll probably see the same patterns with League of Legends. Rating systems provide metrics for you. You don't get to determine what those metrics are. And to be a leader, and to be able to solve problems, your own problems that maybe you feel no one has, the solution is not in the metrics that already exist. It's something you must come up with. So a lot of life qualities and uh, life skills that allow someone to consistently be happy and striving and self-motivated is under practice and underutilized when they spend the majority of their time playing in a system that is designed by someone else. So for me, the reason why I'm doing this and my quote-unquote dedication, which I really appreciate the, the compliment, my dedication to this is because I'm doing something the system doesn't dictate. It's something interesting. If I want to see PP and rating systems, I go and watch someone do it. Because there are plenty of those people, right? And uh, I learn a lot from them. I don't have to be curious about it. People have already done it. And that's kind of the idea. Have you ever talked to a scientist? Scientists are interested in what isn't known, not what is known. And usually that's, that's kind of a vicious cycle because when you learn something new, you just realize how much you don't know and then it just keeps going. And that's kind of what it likes to be uh, intellectual. That's kind of a little bit of a long spiel, but it's not as long as my usual takes, so if you're ever curious about how long these takes get. <laughs> Alright. Uh, did I just... I haven't done this yet, right? Yeah. Let's go. Let's rock it. <laughs> I might have waited a little too long, but that's okay. Okay. 
uh, low-key, one of the secret hidden agendas, quote-unquote, secret goals, is that uh, this is my version of clickbaiting people. Not, not in the sense of the negative thing. Like, there's nothing really clickbaity about this. Like, it's mo most of the stuff is like three to eight hours long. The idea is uh, trying to naturally and organically subvert expectations. I, I believe that with enough time and people who are willing to talk about things, subverting expectations is a very useful tool to allowing uh, two people to exchange ideas. And this exchange of ideas, I truly believe, although not scalable, it's very, very difficult to scale to like hundred thousands of people and 10, you know, millions of people, but at least a smaller maybe hundreds of people to allow them to develop the self-awareness and the life skills that will take them to whatever they want to do. Because I truly believe ex uh, organic, very uh, intellectually and emotionally minded conversations enable and um, most human beings to create enough level of competency about themselves in order to strive for most of the things that they want in life. Uh, these aren't my own words per se, like it's built on the foundation of many, many successful people in this world and in history. If you watch their interviews and stuff, um, you'll happen upon most of the themes that I talk about while I play video games. Uh, I just don't have their ability to, or motivation to make it scalable. So generally speaking, when it comes to that, like comment about low viewer streamer and stuff is it's because, uh, generally pragmatically, I have, I haven't been encouraged or motivated to find a medium or a method to make such things scalable. Um, in order to demonstrate the learning process for myself, I literally have to do those things. That in, involves having someone or encouraging someone to watch like 30 days worth of commentary. That is astronomically impractical in the context of the hustle culture of the internet. So there are many ways to explain why this is at the moment the most ideal type of dynamics that I prefer. Because uh, it requires a very long explainer. And the reward system is that if it's one person, which is myself, if it's just myself, perfectly all right. If it's one other person, that's fantastic. That's, uh, I have no self-motivation to scale any of this stuff. Just to give you an idea of what goes on in my head when it comes to these things or goals in mind in general. Answer previous question. Well, nowadays I just focus on doing what would generally bring me the most dopamine. Okay, dopamine hunting, all right. If I feel like playing for PP would bring me the most joy, I do that. And if I feel like I just playing maps I can barely pass will be fun. I think this comes from the fact that every time in any game, focus in potential. That's great. That's, uh, that is not a subject subject like what you said that is very fine line is accurate i think it's consistently accepted that when you focus on a specific metric right that metric does potentially lead to mental burnout not necessarily physical ones but mostly mental burnouts and you've already demonstrated that you have a lot of flexibility in avoiding this and mitigating it and that's fantastic and it does you also show that you're quite a uh intuitive and emotional player as opposed to myself a bit of a contrast uh a intellectual forward player i seldomly rely on my emotional intelligence and it is also in consequently it's not as rigorous so 
I don't usually express it's under practice like oh yeah this felt awful or use words like man that was bad this was good I pra I try to practice it while I'm playing os but generally speaking I have more to say intellectually than emotionally so for you when you focus on you know what brings you the most dopamine that is a very emotionally intuitive type of approach to enjoying games and it seems like uh, you have some element of understanding that intellectually yes there is a high frequency of potential mental burnout when it comes to a metric oriented focus type of play style right we have to remember that metrics are not necessarily subjective they are meant to be as objective as possible so if you're a person who feels and intuitively play with feeling, a metric is unfeeling. It is designed to be objective. And that kind of interferes and generally lead to mental burnout because it doesn't account for feelings. Like, I'm just saying the logic part of it is you dictate your enjoyment by using an objective metric, but you recognize that you yourself is a feeler, a someone who uses intuition and emotional, their enhanced emotional intelligence, their well-practiced emotional intelligence. Generally speaking, that does lead to burnout. And I agree with you with that statement because the, a large majority of people who play video games in general especially competitive video games, they are in a stage of life and a way of thinking that's far more emotionally intelligent than they are intellectually intelligent. I play video games primarily not for fun. So like, just to counter and offer a different perspective, uh, I don't play video games because it's fun or it elicits dopamine. I play video games out of curiosity. And the dopamine comes after. I establish dopamine by the reward of what happens afterwards. So in the moment, it could be something that actually doesn't even elicit dopamine. It might actually elicit cortisol, uh, you know, cortisol secretion, which is the stress hormone, by the way. And uh, all that stress becomes a source of endorphins and dopamine after the fact. So if someone has a problem, like say they approach me with a life problem, I don't think of what is it in it for me? How does it balance? How much dopamine am I getting? So I do the thing and see what happens. So it prevents me from pre-selecting my tasks because I don't particularly want to do that. And uh, natural curiosity doesn't have a requirement before, like curiosity is the requirement. So if I haven't done it, I am more likely to do it regardless of what the outcome is. It could end up really terrible, by the way. Like I could find out that I'm insensitive, incompetent, arrogant, and I just had an all around bad time. But then I learned all of that about myself. And that's where the dopamine comes from. So if I threw my keyboard across the room, like something elicited me to throw my keyboard across the room, then I've learned something about myself. So even if the results, quote unquote, the results, the data shows that it might be a negative thing, it's not a negative thing to me because you're always actively discovering something. So I realized that this game makes me angry. That's an interesting tidbit. Um, and you learn, that's how the learning process works. If you're always pre-selecting your experiences based on your criteria, you learn less and less. You actually habitually lean towards things that you're comfortable with. So you are, it's not saying you're not happy. Uh, many people have learned enough ways to be sustainable so that 
they can often pre-select accurately to consistently say happy for the rest of their lifetime. When that happens, generally that's when learning stops. So when you have acquired enough skills and to pre-select your choices and whatnot, you have, you have no need or pressure to do more learning. So as when you come to that age, maybe in your 30s or your 40s, hopefully, right? Fingers crossed. Um, if you're still doing that, that might be a little bit tough um, when you're in your later age and you're still learning stuff to cope, right? Um, generally, learning stops there. And for me, learning is my skill. I don't stop learning. But that's it. Like not what not what I learn, the skill of learning. So how do I keep changing my approach in learning? Because there are a lot of things people create. There are a lot of problems that are going to may or may not happen. The idea is constantly learning to be able to adapt to those things. So why am I doing OSU right now? It's just another learning potential. Uh, I don't know what, how, what value this will have in the future, but I'm recording it for the sake of knowing that it can have value. So I'm investing forward. Constantly do, staying in the present to invest forward. Well, it also is somewhat physical since some days one skill set might just be better than others. If your goal is to focus on those skill sets, yes. Uh, a day is always better when you have no expectations. You're just trying to extract all the things that worked, all the things that didn't work, and it's always a positive information, right? As a person who is scholarly and constantly learning, every additional day you live is something, is an opportunity to understand something else about it. There's no like, you don't go backwards. Uh, when you focus on a skill set and try to be objective about it, like your skills went up one day, it went down one day, there is negative progress. There's a perspective, a psychological consideration for when something goes up and reverse. It's both up and down from baseline. From a learner's perspective, it only goes up. There's only an uptrend. Now, there are extenuating circumstances, which can, like, the trade-off is there are extenuating circumstances that hurt a learner. Uh, when you learn something and it interferes with the thing you're going to learn, and that is an emotional consideration that does require some coping mechanisms and emotional intelligence to navigate. So, for example, to show you a trade-off of being a learner when you learn java for example if you're just into java for whatever reason and that java knowledge interferes with picking up c sharp right c sharp c plus plus it would require some sort of level of compartmentalization and kind of detraining like it, so that learning process can feel like it interferes with the new learning process. And that's kind of like a step backwards, per se. But usually that's not that big a deal. Most people who have that type of mentality and personality is able to uh, navigate the two things. So for example, right now, how does this relate to exactly what I'm doing now? I used to tap on my middle finger and my pointer finger. Now I tap on my pointer finger and ring finger. It comes with some interference, right? Because my pointer finger is synced with my middle finger. And in say the first 10 days, it was fairly clear that my ring finger has a missed time or a very consistent uh, actuation, like, like movement time compared to my middle finger when paired up with my index finger. So those things can be a little bit of problematic. Although it's still more information, so that's kind of the idea. 
So, uh, very mental forward. Lots of times uh, when you get older, often physical things don't really pay out. They, they have diminished return. One thing that is timeless is your intellectual intelligence. And that's my bias, obviously, because that's something I prefer, something that I overweight in. Just as a little bit of a side cut, right? What are you, where are you at in business administration? Are you at the university level? Are you like 19, 20 years old, something like that? You don't, uh, based on your like communication skills and your like word choice, even from Latvia, I would say you're at least post high school, right? This is assuming that the Latvian education system is similar to other European systems, which is similar to Americanized education system. There's a lot of assumptions there that I'm making, that I'm presuming, so you can definitely elaborate on any misnomers or leap of logic that I have applied there. Very difficult to uh, not be distracted by my thoughts. Uh, yes, University 21 last year, writing my bachelor's next semester. Nice, way to go, man! You're at the you're at the finish line for your bachelor's. No positive thing about Latvia that I didn't mention previously. Many people here speak two to three languages. Fair enough. Fair enough. Latvian, Russian, and English. I understand. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you probably... Uh, I wonder how much the reach is, the combination of Latvian and Russian. What's the reach? I, I'm guessing lots of the Russian countries. But how widespread is Latvian? I remember. I, I imagine like the Baltic states. Is it Baltic? Yeah, Baltic states. That might be expandable. School system in Latvia is really simple. Nine or twelve years of school. Okay, if you want to start working young, you can do nine. Oh, that's interesting. That's actually different. If you do uni, you can do twelve years. Oh, wait. Your default is. Wow, that's accelerated actually. So it's not very... It, 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 that's a big difference. Latvian is only in Latvia. No other Baltic countries use it. Oh, okay, fair enough. Fair enough. Uh, in the United States, is a little different, right? Uh, depending on uh, who the, 
a di diverse background, but generally speaking, um, it is rather a misconception of you be very, very, uh, from the outside, it would be very, very surprising for someone to not underestimate how common it is to have multiple languages in a household. The reason that there's a misconception is that formally English is the primary language. As in, like, the requirements is English. That does not necessarily accurately reflect how often multilingual households have. Like, in fact, there's a heightened interest a lot of times of heritage when it comes to other languages. Now, in terms of fluency, that's a little different story. Since we have, since the United States doesn't have a system that measures fluency in other languages other than English, it would be very hard to have the statistical metrics to actually know what, how common it is. For myself, I actually speak a dialect that is only regional to a specific part of China with my family. And then I listen and casually speak in Mandarin and Cantonese when appropriate. And I, I was actually schooled in Spanish. Spanish being arguably the second largest language in the United States. And, um, and I'm a hobbyist. Call me an enthusiast of the Japanese language. In fact, the fun thing about that language is next year, in less than two months, I am going to spend one year seeing how far I can get by evaluating a game, gamified app, which you probably have heard of, using that as a platform to learn Japanese and Mandarin at the same time. Because I have some exposure to both. I have a lot of ear training when it comes to Mandarin and Japanese. So I'll be doing that next year. You recently found out that Japanese alphabet is used in Taiwan? Oh, that's a nice... That's a... I, I was not aware of that. That's interesting. Uh, the only thing I can contribute to Taiwan is that uh, Taiwanese has a close relation with Cantonese, which is largely spoken in Hong Kong. Sometimes I kind of get uh, like some of the syllables and the tonality com uh, like mixed between Taiwanese and the Cantonese that Hong Kong people use. I don't even know how you refer to someone. I guess Canto in general. Yeah, interesting. So Japanese alphabet, there's a crosstalk between Japanese alphabet and Taiwan, Taiwanese. Or Taiwan in general? Or are you referring to the language in Taiwan? Like Taiwanese. Uh, the way that's interpreted, I'm not entirely sure if you're referring to using Japanese alphabet in Taiwan, as in the country of Taiwan, which I could see, or that the Japanese alphabet uh, is used in Taiwanese. It's a really interesting thing either way. I, I think that's pretty... Because uh, uh, being raised multicultural, right, as Chinese, uh, it's kind of a culture shock a lot of times where you can find places where you just walk in and suddenly it, it just uh, phases between English to like Mandarin all over the place. And there are very surprising places where this happens, not just in Chinatowns around the world. Like, it, it's always a very a curious observation when you're just walking, you know, English, 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 and then suddenly it's like, wait a minute, everything's in Italian. And then you just realize you crossed into Little Italy, Italy for example. That's, it's, a very, it's a far more common occurrence than one might think, especially in the United States. Um, 
when you're in a metropolitan area or a cultural a cultural hub in the United States, there are, are plenty of those because there are multiple capitals for multiple states, and they represent what we talked about about your capital being beautiful, or your country. In a way, in the United States, there are multiple cap capitals of each state, and each state has that semblance of representation, and they tend to be the cultural hub of that state. In Pennsylvania, ugh, the capital is a, a city called Harrisburg, and it's very rustic. And it truly does represent 70 to 80 percent of Pennsylvania. However, the state that I live in, the most iconic one internationally through media and stuff is Philadelphia, which is a city that is represented, that actually misrepresents 80% of the rest of Pennsylvania. And I actually live in the other 80%. However, I absolutely love Philadelphia, which is the cultural hub, arguably the cultural hub of the state I live in right? currently. Fun times, I tell you. Cultural talk is... It's my jam. I had so many thoughts during that. Uh, apparently it's not the same. Maybe I misunderstood something. All right, that's all right. We had a student from Taiwan who mentioned this, but maybe he meant that it happened in the past or something. Hey, if you dig deep enough, you'll probably get you know all the connections. So I don't like. It's, it's great that you have the initiative to remember such details. I imagine if you dig deep enough, they're probably relational. 
because we have to remember that how the origin of language works, right? Uh, generally speaking, if you're thinking of, about it from a logical standpoint, uh, a language has common ancestry, just as, you know, the different types of people on this planet. So I wouldn't be surprised if there was a deviation that has a common link. And I would probably say China, right? The mainland China. So you kind of like trace back a lot uh, as as far as you can go, you know, as you slowly go back, there's probably a connection and a resemblance between uh, Taiwanese and Japanese, knowing that how humans populate the planet and migrated. And then eventually Japanese become isolated and Taiwan became isolated enough to allow their language, which might most definitely have originated from a common pool of people where like the current China is, right? Not saying Chinese or Mandarin, the current contemporary Mandarin themselves. But generally speaking, when you're thinking about uh, etymology of language, as you go back, there is an inherent logic to uh, feeling like it makes sense. And likely, there is some truth to that, right? It's not about being accurate, you know? It's more about being the willingness to share and pick up, entertain ideas. And I like the idea that you went to uh, look for yourself. I mean, it's still a fun consideration. Like, we don't know if it's true or not, right? Not without enough digging. I would say logic dictates that, generally speaking, Taiwan, uh, Taiwanese and Japanese has a common parental language. And if you know, if you go back far enough and determine what that parental language is, then you can use whatever the etymology of that parental language to see the commonality between Taiwanese and Japanese. Kind of like, uh, you know, in Europe, right, where we use English or like I use English, right? It's Germanic in origins, but then we have a huge other branch that populates most of Europe, right? The Romance languages, Spanish, French, Italian. So at some point when you trace it back, uh, you'll be able to highlight the commonalities between. And in terms of Asian languages, you bet it's tracing back to what is now today mainland China, right? I, my, my fun things uh, when I talk about uh, Asian languages is all the cognates that exist between the two languages. Like, I'm a Japanese enthusiast, right? I like, I love hearing and be entertained by the Japanese language, but at the same time, I most commonly hear Mandarin and Fujianese, which is a dialect, uh, it, a Chinese dialect, um, and pick up just random words that just sound like other words. Like for example, uh, uh, ramen, right? You gotta, you can't, you can't be into the Japanese culture without uh, pulling up the ramen. But in my dialect, in my parents' dialect, is nomi. And in Mandarin, uh, it, it comes off more like la mian, which is like ramen. <laughs> and sure enough, the origins, if you think about the etymology, etymology, like the word themselves, you can trace it back. Obviously, I'm not suggesting that, quote unquote, Kekona, lo main is similar to ramen, right? They're, they're like the actual literal entities have changed over the many, many years, at least the years that I've been alive. Um, but the terminology, like the, the syllables and syllogisms of the language, they're very reminiscent of each other. Um, especially you can trace back in Asian cultures just as much as you can with like the interplay between Spanish 
Portuguese and Italian. Like when I sometimes I don't I usually am not ballsy enough because I've only had six or seven years of Spanish and that was like over more than six years ago. And when I read something, I'm like, hmm. I know some of those words, but there is significant overlap to not be the not be the language I think. And when it comes to hearing Asian languages, it's it's kind of similar for me. Uh, that's only because that's one one of the big reasons is because I am multiculturally Asian. So there is quite a lot of overlap. Not to be confused, like like Hindi is very or uh, what Punjabi, right? Is not as closely related. However, when it comes to like very specific Japanese terms, Mandarin, Taiwanese, maybe even like Cambodian, Laos, Thai, there there's some really really fun things where like oh you don't understand you don't understand and suddenly a word just pops up. i was like wait a minute is that the same as <laughs> like uh counting is a great one i think counting is fantastic to illustrate that like each knee sa right and then you have like uh my my dialect like eight nay song that the three is so characteristically like imbues the same type of emphasis like sun sa and uh e er sun like they're they're the three for whatever reason is just like ah you know we, we just like that sound ish thing so when you're like butchering threes you can probably hit like four or five different languages Asian languages, I'm just saying. It, it's to, to the amateur ear, right? Like, to me, like, I'm not fluent enough to, like, if someone said something, like, started counting, and I'm like, they say three a bunch of times, like, man, why does three just sound so samey? Hmm, three is odd because in English, Russian, and Latvia, it's almost all the same. Yeah, like, what? Why three? <laughs> <laughs> that that's one of the few observations I've made before. Like I, I just don't get it. Like one is like really different. Two is really different. But suddenly when you get to three, it's just like, uh okay. Somehow they just universally agree that three <laughs> I just I, I love sharing that one because um when it comes to Asian languages, a lot of times there's this, uh, the archetypical, like, YouTube media portrayal chooses language that are ve very distinctly separated now, right? Mandarin, Japanese, and a Pacific island, uh, a very specific Pacific, Pacific island. They've separated quite a bit now where it feels like when you know one, it might not be relevant to another one. However, to me, who spends a lot of time hearing this all the time, I actually can, uh, I actually hear the three problem, like the, the three weirdness over and over again a lot of times. Like, uh, what is, um, what was the Korean version for noodles? What is the Korean word for noodles? Uh, it's very close. It's it's kind of like la min no no la. It, it's very close. Like for whatever reason, all the all the noodle versions are all the same too. These are very cherry picky because I'm not fluent in any of those languages that I've mentioned, uh, and I am not I'm not a linguistics expert, so I don't actually know the etymology. But my guess, right, just to go, take it back to what we were just talking about, my guess. Is that uh, la mian is like one of the origins, and then it separated into it. I have no idea what Taiwanese people would use the term for noodles. 
these things come up because I love noodles, right? I have a bucket of noodles right here, actually. <laughs> Sorry. It's a, it's a slight digression, but I really love talking to multicultural people. And, and having conversations about multiculturalism. Like, you don't have to literally be a multicultural person, but having discussions about different cultures. Um, again, always learning. Always learning. I ask you about your country and your scene and stuff, because that, that's what it's about. And then I try to share something from where I am from in the United States and oftentimes my conversations have to be awfully specific when I offer something because generally speaking I have to qualify where I am in the United States it's not representative of other parts of the United States what do you plan on doing with business administration Alex now that we know that you're about to complete your degree, which by the way, it's accelerated by three years. Um, so are you telling me, wait, 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 actually, when you say nine years, right? Uh, how many grades do you have in Latvia? You just have nine grades, like from the age of five, you spend nine years to get your before uni stuff done? It's not nine or twelve grades? Okay, go on. It, it, oh, it is nine or twelve, okay. So does that translate to nine or twelve years? And what age do kids start going to school is it five with nine years you can't do university yeah that's fine uh so that's like equivalent to what i would refer to here in the united states as high school like a high school graduate so are those kids 14 years old 14 15 oh wait 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 wait, wait. oh wait 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 hold up If you stop at 9, oh, 9 through 12 is high school, but you can choose to stop before completing high school if you're not interested in uni. 5, 6, 7, I think. You start at 6. Oh, that's so interesting. So technically, when you enter your ninth year, you can just be like, I don't plan on going to university, so you can just not do the remaining three years. How often do people just do the 12 years anyways? In the United States, you do not have- it's not a choice. It's more like you do the 12 years. It's just understood. Whether you decide to drop out or not is not- not really a, like, a common practice, per se. Like, how often do kids just do the 12 years anyways to leave the option open for uni, but not go to university? That's a fun, fun curiosity for me. Like, I'm really curious how that would uh, be applied in the United States, right? Like, what if that was offered? I would honestly think that in this pragmatic society that the United States have. The reason why that's not an option is largely by default. I believe most people will still do the 12 years to leave the option open for u university. Quite often, since many of the jobs have to require have the requirement, and also people by the age of 15, 16 usually haven't planned their life enough to quit school. Yeah. Yep. So. Yes, also most people do finish the full 12 years. That's a really fun thought experiment though, Alex. Like, um, so what you just told me is a very clever example that I could use in the future to contrast. Because, um, oftentimes, I don't know about you, uh, it, it appears your country has a different mentality in 
the current state of the United States, the formal education, a lot of times high school is where the most conflict of interest happens, where um, there's an increasing number of youth that feels that high school is a waste of time. So there's always, there's generally this talk about, so what happens if you just make high school optional, right? However, I like to think that in general, by the time, if you take all the averages, kids will naturally still probably choose to do the 12 years and their parents, right? Also encouraged by their parents in order to have options open. So like leaving options, even if you are given the choice, having the option is a greater driver than personal preference at that time of your life, generally speaking. Obviously the ones that I'm worried about are a smaller portion, like a, a smaller but still growing group of kids in the United States feel that high school could be optional. And I always wondered, and that's kind of cool that your country actually has that option. However, it kind of now, obviously, I'm a little biased. I, I love education. My my prominent thing is about youth health. Like I, I feel like that's my calling in life most of the time concerning about young adults, right? Especially about to graduate and deciding on uni and whatnot. Uh, it's interesting that, yeah, most people, and obviously it's also reflective in the system. You've noted that many jobs also have that requirement. So in the United States, you can't, it's a very similar thing. If you make high school optional, most of the infrastructure, right, the other things around it will still drive most people or most kids and their adults that govern, you know, the, the adults that guide those kids, they will most likely still complete high school, um, all 12 years, leaving the option open for university if it's necessary. Uh, the United States typically do not have a system in place to really aid uh, students that drop out of high school. It's not a bad or a good thing, it's just a thing that is different. And I've always wondered what that would be like in a different country. <laughs> and now you have. That's so fascinating. Sorry, I'm, I'm like talking circles, but oh man. I would be really floored if you said most people just don't go to- just don't complete three years of high school in your country. Like, that would be... I would want to learn everything about how that works. <laughs> Alright. So what do you plan on doing with your uh, degree? Uh, we call it a degree here. I'm not sure if you use a different term. Sometimes people use the word note. Like, you get your note. Um, and what happened? What are you thinking about now that you're close to graduating? Is there a post uni? What are the requirements for a post uni? Like after your bachelor's? I'll try to uh, see how long I waited here.
Uh, I wish I could wait that long and still be able to do this. Well, you did the shorter version of the school system here. But another additional thing we have after the nine years, you can do something call it technical college. Fair enough. Yes, I'm familiar with that. It is still called a technical college uh, here. Uh, sometimes uh, another word is vocational. Technical college is a is is a term used, although it's still after high school. It's an alternative to universities, um, the thing that we're aligning in. So, uh, we we uh, there are technical college or vocational places in the United States. Uh, where you do the next three years plus one additional year, and during those four years, you focus on a specific profession such as mechanic, etc. Yeah, so that it does align similarly here. Uh, a technical school gives you what we call the on the job training as well as education. So the idea is that when you leave with a degree from a technical school, you have uh, gain enough experience for a very specific profession as opposed to hunting for that specific profession and specializing after the education which is where university comes in most of the time uh, for me I would be down with any job opportunity in the in some sector such as banking or similar the dream would be starting your own business but I would like to gain some real working job experience before that that is incredibly a mature perspective it's nice to hear that you have a very grounded and also open uh perspective on uh entry right a lot of times uh one of the biggest struggles one of the first mile like roadblocks along the way is the idea that schooling 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 doesn't substitute for experience Right. And sometimes experience might not necessarily be like, oh, I need I don't need experience for what I spent a lot of time learning is you also discover with experience if the job is not for you. If you think about it, like experience goes both ways. So being open to getting as many job opportunities as you can in a related way in a related manner while allows one to obtain enough experience to really make the incredibly important decision of where your career goes it's not just to gain experience so that you can achieve and go towards the goal you have in mind sometimes when you take in a lot of experience you might end up with a job idea that you didn't originally set out to make and I don't usually use my personal status as a example most of the time however I will say just a slight hot take most people who focus on their specific careers long enough typically end up in a career that they didn't originally start out to envision. Not because it wasn't like commitment or conviction or resolution. You have to keep in mind that when you set out to do something, things change as you're doing it. And when you're thinking about high careers and professionalism, we're talking about five years, six years, periods at least periods of five years and things change so if you're keeping hold on to a vision that you can't see in five years having an open mind and always willing to look for experience and playing along with that experience usually end up the and what what do i call this the life hack that most influencers will probably exchange in an interview, right? The ones that made it. So for me, I set out to be something I clearly did not end up being. In fact, uh, 
most of my best friends are highly educated. Actually, my closest friends, they are all, they all have PhDs in biology. And there is not a consistent career type among the four of us. So, actually five. And then those who have master's degrees, bachelor's degrees, like those who open their business, it's, it's usually very dynamic. So I really like that you have that type of perspective. And I think you previously mentioned the post back, yeah, post bachelor's university. And I think it's the same as US where you can do master's and then PhD. Okay, fair enough. Have you ever considered that? I'm actually kind of curious. You have a, um, just saying that somehow OS, right? You, you talked about OS and League of Legends, but the way you talk about education, yeah, your education and other things, it strikes to me as like, you can very well be someone who's able, who's uh, very suitable to be an expert at something like a master's or a PhD in something, right? There is a caveat, like in, like in the United States, when it comes to like business and administration, generally speaking, uh, not, it, it's not very pragmatic to keep going up in higher education. Generally a master's, like an additional one or two years for a master's is very pragmatic and high in value. However, you know, going higher in PhD, self-study is usually fairly reasonable instead of going to formal education and trying to get the degree, right? I w you would like to do master's at least. I still feel like I need some real life experience before that to understand what I'm more interested in professionally. That is incredible. Like, if, if I were like, for example, hypothetically, if I were your academic advisor, I would totally be like, this kid knows what they're doing. Like, that's an incredibly great response. Uh, just to give you an idea for me, after I finished uni, right? After I got my bachelor's, I actually spent two years working at a government lab in order to figure out if I wanted to seek a PhD in science, in biology. So I did take that break too, to get uh, experience, on uh, job experience, to see if this is for me. And I don't wanna paint sunshine and rainbows. Even after all those experiences, I still found myself learning new things about myself as I was going into the PhD program. And then that deviated into other things. So just the idea that you're always constantly looking to gain experience and insight about yourself. Yeah. Hands down, not even concerned. Like that's an incredibly mature way of looking at things. And uh, it makes for a very consistent, successful person. I, I'd, be, I'd be willing. Uh, it would be really fun to hear what happens. Like four years, you know, another two years or three years, what you decide to do. I'm, it's incredibly exciting for me because I love seeing uh, one of the most heartwarming. Okay, speaking of dopamine, let's connect back to what you said about dopamine. I am a sap. And being a sap means that when I see good things happen and kids like passionately going off to um, like start new chapters in their life, that's where the dopamine comes from. Absolutely. So if you're kind of like sappy like me, watching kids grow up and then like, you know, you walk on stage, grab that diploma, and then they share where they're going to go in the next two or three years, man, that is, that is some choice dopamine. Not so much for video games, but choice. Choice when chapters of people, like, it's, it's incredibly fulfilling especially if i had some privilege in educating a person that that's like the the goat uh, i mean you would have to 
be like me in order to love actually educating people, right? Because then you would not really have that many dopamine motivations if you don't feel satisfying watching other people succeed. I really appreciate it. That's pretty awesome, though. I, I look forward to hearing what you end up deciding to do in another year or two. Keep that in mind. I'd love to hear your uh, exploits and your success stories. Or even your obstacles, right? Obstacles are made to be conquered. So, all of the above kind of thing. I have one other question. Do Lavians usually leave the nest after high school? So like, are you at the university or something? Like what is the common protocol when someone finishes high school? Do you leave the nest? Yeah, we need to drop down. I've waited too long. Uh, let's try to wrap this up by doing something that I have control over. Uh, maybe here? <clears throat> you live with your folks? Okay. Usually the way it goes is you get a long-term job, then you move out. See, that... That is, uh... That is something relatable now. Um, it was a period, my generation. So if uh, the millennial generation of the United States, right? Like people in the United States, I think over 50%. So like the majority of youth are expected to leave the nest after they graduate high school. I say that because now there's a paradigm shift. Um, in the last, I would say, after like, out, I'm in my 30s now. So at least when I was approaching my 30s, there's been a shift where it's similar to that actually. It's a lot more common now. I'm not sure if it took over the majority or not, um, but Typically, kids stay with their folks until they can uh, find sustainability of some sort, right? So, it's kind of interesting that there has been quite a shift in that. And I've always wondered that. Um, it's very important to me to know these things because if you think about it, this is why OS is related, by the way. Because when you have OS players, the age range is commonly between 16 and 19 and depending you know os is a internet thing and there's a lot of different cultures right so sometimes yeah uh one must be familiar with what the what kind of the mindset they are in and a lot of times i mean the vast majority that i encounter is usually 18 to 19 basically that decision and it varies quite often it's always interesting to ask what like what the like life situation is and whatnot. At least that's something interesting to me. Right? You get to know someone. Really by the type of pressures they're under. 
You might be wondering how does this relate to enjoying video games or playing a game like O's? When you have a lot of life pressures, it really does affect how you enjoy video games and use video games as a tool. So often when I'm focusing on like trying to get people to be open to certain ideas like using video games as a way to learn about the self on how to tackle like life decisions and stuff, you kind of have to know where they're, what type of social pressures that they are experiencing at the time, right? And in the United States, I think there's still a common pressure. I don't know how, to what extent that when you're about to graduate high school, it's the big decision on whether you leave the house, like leave the nest or not. It's still an ever looming pressure. And with every subsequent year, the pressure continues to build and build. And that's where you get into the late stage OS player a lot of times. I would say it's fair to even generalize it to most competitive games. And I specifically use the word competitive games because it's definitely less so when it's in a non-competitive environment. Generally speaking, non-competitive environments are more attracted, uh, attractive to individuals who aren't pressured to have to prove themselves. Like they're not in a stage of life where they're aiming for performance or affirmation. Like myself. It's not to say that uh, I, um, they're not literally young or literally old. I'm more talking about the mindset, like how intellectually mature they are or not mature they are, where they are in their stage of life. So if you're constantly thinking like you can't find reward in not doing something competitive, then generally speaking, I would say you're intellectually young and it comes with benefits and trade-offs. Uh, one thing that a young mind has who constantly participates in competitive competitive things to get affirmation is that uh, the young mind has not formed an identity yet. And without an identity, creativity is hamstrung, right? You, you're, you're not practicing creativity. And what happens often is, what is the advantage of being more mature? Well, while learning and ambition might subside when you become mature, your ambition and learning doesn't necessarily require a lot of TLC because you have become a self-identifying adult with creativity. So generally speaking, your selling point as someone who has a lot of experience is that you're non-competitive with the other people. Like you've lived long enough, gain enough experience that you become more and more irreplaceable. So you don't necessarily have to seek performing and competing on terms with other people. That's one of the biggest giveaways in my opinion. If, you, if I go from playing a, uh, talking to people who are watching or come across me playing a competitive game, a game that has a rating system, which is very rare because I don't really play too many games with a rating system. And when you catch me doing it, I'm not actually playing on the rating system, right? I'm an old guy or an older guy. I'm like 60 intellectually, just saying. There, that's a deep cut for another time. But when you're younger, you're in the competitive scene. You're looking for performance. You're still discovering and looking for something you can specialize in. You're seeking experience. But sooner or later, in my opinion, one of the telltale signs that you've made it is that you start thinking in a way like, nah, see, I'm irreplaceable. Because I don't have to compete in the same system when I can make the system and change the system myself. So when you're asking me, how do I enjoy O's? Well, it's not gaining PP. And you're one, you know, I'm tying it back to gaming now. What 
What is a telltale sign that I'm looking for when I'm thinking about how people play video games? There's a lot you can tell about a person by the way they talk about video games, play video games. And it's even more so true now because video games has become a substantial part of every age group. There was a time when video games are more like, eh, you just do it as a hobby. It doesn't really impact or consume a lot of your psychological dispositions in in real life, right? Because uh, video games took up a smaller portion of people's lives. It's not the case anymore. And why did I choose... Uh, and that's kind of the motivation of using video games as a platform for these discussions. Uh, I... If, if it changes, then you'll see that I won't be playing video games. I, I like to uh, pick a tool or a vehicle that applies to young people. And I assure you, video games probably trumped TV, TV, right? Uh, or like shows, movies, books. Uh, like all the other mediums where uh, kids typically used to take inspiration from and learn and like make mistakes and misinterpret and learn all those mediums have subsided now like they're they're getting they're playing second fiddle to video games it's a great time as an adult if you want to make an impact or influence kids like in a very humble like a, in a kind way like try to encourage problem solving or critical thinking you can design a game for that like you would have a platform that will reach out even more so my i you know the idea of a popular studio making a puzzler that deals with how to sort logic that could make lots of kids exercise and practice logic without them even knowing really like imagine logic being intuitive that is a weird oxymoron because logic generally is not intuitive until you understand it it's generally a knowledge check so that's kind of why video games are great i'm starting to get back to your original question that you asked me about why what's my goal for doing this it's definitely not all of the things you listed. It's great if those things happen, for sure, absolutely. If it's great if my tapping becomes more consistent and, you know, I can stream different BPMs. But now you kind of, now I've revealed my hand. Like, it, it's very secondary. Like, it's not really at all in the radar, right? It's this stuff. I mean, let's be real, if you really wanted to have someone you're following who knows how to get more tapping consistency, better streaming and stuff, there's a lot of OS players that I would highly recommend you check out. And I don't even have to say that because you're probably thinking that already. If you played O's long enough, you probably know this is not what a person who has tapping consistency and uh, performance-based motivations in mind. This is not what that looks like. Like if you look at my profile and look at the most played maps, that's not a profile of someone who can ever offer you any advice on how to get good at OSA's PP system. What I'm offering is to show you what it looks like in reality when you're not doing something in your element. Because when you grow older and you're looking for experience and job training and careers and interacting with other people, this is what it looks like most of the time. And the best part here is no one will know if I'm successful at what I'm doing until they ask. What am I doing getting these 
all the time on 160 BPM to a young inexperienced person it might not it might look like oh yeah I'm probably finger locking and you know trying to get better get faster and stuff it's, yeah that that's probably what it looks like absolutely I have no reason to deny or try to co contradict that that's probably what it looks like when you become more experienced that's that's it well, I hope you understand how much people like me are really learning from me just by talking about your opinions and thoughts about different. I really love, like, that actually makes my heart, like, very, very, like, that's wonderful. Like, I, that's really kind words. That how much people like you are really learning from me. I hope you get anything from me. It's great. You don't necessarily have to learn anything from me, but I love that you're willing to share and I think even the act of sharing makes you more competent about yourself you know, I understand that your focus is not improving a lot but oh yeah yeah like I basically already threw out the <laughs> uh, completing the rest of the stuff but yeah I, I hope one day like um my my goal is that one day anything I say even like a word right helps you be successful like in any way that's probably if i had to uh summarize why i record things and why i share it publicly that is the only thing that is important to me the idea that maybe someone somewhere heard like five seconds of my eight hour rant and that was enough for them to go on and become millionaires or do whatever they desire travel the world and become like i don't know a foodie or something that that's kind of the best part i i don't record it because i want to show off well technically i kind of lie i am showing something off but it's not the thing that i'm literally doing i'm trying to show off in the sense that I'm challenging myself to see how how much I can engage someone and man I can tell you if you're at uni doing a business administration and you're playing O's and League of Legends that really speaks volumes because uh, here, here's a something that will resonate with you when I was in college I played World of Warcraft <laughs> Like World of Warcraft happened when I was in college, and man, did I have to give up, the, give that up fast. So, it's kind of nice to see that you're able to balance O's League of Legends while you're at university, because World of Warcraft made it very, very difficult. That was my like game experience going into college. World of Warcraft, yikes! <laughs> and we're talking about like classic. World of Warcraft when when you know the only thing you had was World of Warcraft vanilla that was tough I was young and immature so I didn't understand how to balance them like balance not needing to be really good quote unquote good at World of Warcraft right keeping it but still loving World of Warcraft so as you can imagine, when I'm older now, it's like, yeah, I can totally play World of Warcraft, enjoy it to some extent, and still maintain a job, right? Right? That is possible. When I was young, it was very hyper-focused. And there was not enough time to deviate because I didn't have the experience to balance that stuff. Yeah, but that comes from the difference between the things we study. You actually have to study to become the things you are. Well, I don't, when I don't even want to comment on who could finish the course I'm studying. Interesting. So yeah, but that comes from the difference between the things we study. You actually have to study to become the things you are. Well, I don't even want to comment on who could finish the course I'm studying. That's an interesting thought. 
do I actually have to study to become the things I am? No, no, oh, uh, no worries. I, I can understand that it's late in Latvia. It's probably almost 2 a.m., right? Maybe, uh, yeah, 2 a.m., maybe, over there. You don't have school, do you? You don't have university, right? Well, I meant you chose, you chose a hard thing to study while mine is really easy. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell you that I understand what you're trying to say. And I'm gonna throw a little bit of a curveball. Oh, it's Saturday? Oh yeah, that's right. Wait, it is Saturday? Oh my gosh, I don't even know what day it is. Oh yeah, it is Saturday. <laughs> Sorry, my bad. I didn't even consider that <laughs> it's the weekend. I've lost track of time. My bad. Um, okay. Let me, let me, uh, try to offer a different perspective. The thing I chose is hard because you're not studying it. The thing you're doing is hard to me because I'm not studying it. So, um, if it's any, uh, if it offers any comfort, there are hard things are things you don't pursue. Easy things are things you do pursue. So, what you're telling me is that you can appreciate things you don't know and also things you do know. So, you find it that it's reasonable to call the things you're the stuff that you study easy and the stuff that you don't study hard. And that gives me an idea that you have a level headedness. You understand that when you don't study something or you can appreciate hard things because you have not done them. What I can tell you is the feeling is mutual. What you're doing is hard for me because I didn't choose to study them. So there's no elements I'm trying to dispel or trying to uh, disrupt that idea that there are things that makes people smarter and not smarter. As in, like, there's different types of people that study different types of things. They're just people who decide the things they study ends up being easy overall, and then the things they don't generally appears hard. However, in a different life, in a different lifetime, Alex, if you chose to study science and get a PhD, in, upon reflection, you will probably be in my position where you understand that the things that you don't know are very hard and that's what's exciting that's why I like hard things so like why do I play O's? it's because it's hard right? like I, I don't do it often enough so is it hard for me? it's hard for me because I don't play it enough it's easy for those who play it a lot now the question is, how do I get the people who play O's religiously, right, to do that for other things? So, how do I get an O's player? Well, you think you'll just have to disagree on this one? I understand your perspective, but simply the things we are learning for 80% of the courses are mostly borderline common knowledge or something that people would just have learned previously learned in high school. I'm going to tell you now, the first couple of years when you pursue science is a review of all the things you learned in high school. I, I know you're, you're trying to disagree, but what you just described is the first two years of science. It's just a discipline you did decide not to pick. Yeah. You're... I'm not here to convince you 
how you should feel. If you feel that way, that's absolutely okay. I What I really want to communicate is that you are far more capable as a person than you think. I don't want to rob you of thinking that when you think something is hard, it's unachievable. Or if it's hard, that you, you know, you should stray away from it. I think anyone who's capable of doing what you do is capable of everything else too. It's just that the thing that makes it easy, in my opinion, in my opinion, that makes it easy is you like certain things. You emotionally resonate with certain things. And that lowers the barrier of difficulty. Since you didn't resonate with science, it doesn't appear easier, right? Like someone who hates math, but loves biology. They don't resonate with math, so the barrier is higher. I, I agree with you in extreme circumstances, like really, really extreme circumstances. You might be able to see particular people who are built to do certain things, and I get that. However, I'm comparing you with the hypothetical you. So, your disagreeing is insisting to me that you believe that the way you're born, if you made different decisions, there were going to be dramatically different outcomes. And I can see that. I can see how it's felt that way. Like, if there were a clone of you, right? If there were two of you, one decide to pursue science and one decide to pursue business administration. Uh, the feeling is that the person, the, per, the you, the version you that chose science is going to underperform. And I totally get that. I understand. Because sometimes it feels like you don't, you're, you don't have the skills or the intuition or the ability to do so. I get that feeling all the time. Like, I'm not a, uh, I'm not a professional OS player, right? Like, if I chose to be a professional host player, would that mean just believing that I'm capable? Probably not. So I totally understand that feeling. Absolutely. And it's, a, it's both. I'm not saying it's not what you're saying as well. I'm offering an alternative, alternative perspective. It's a mix of both. Generally, in the cosmic analyses of science in general, it's a little from column A, and a little from column B, and a little from all the columns that we don't know, right? So, I'm not disagreeing with you. You can choose to disagree with me, but I'm in agreement with you, and I'm adding to it that it's both. Uh, you'd be surprised how subjectively easy something you like and resonate with can be hard when you choose not to pursue it so everything I do that I have never done right like over my life all the things that I have never done they're hard initially and they th and then they become easy uh, we're not talking about whether they're objectively hard or not and I agree with you there is some objectivity of the demands of the job what I'm trying to focus on is your perception of what is hard and what is easy. And generally speaking, I find whatever you're doing very hard because I don't know how to do it yet. It's hard because I don't know how to do it. It's easy if I know what you're doing. And it's always, and generally speaking, psychologically, that is subjectively true. Almost 99% of the time is subjectively true. It may not be obje objectively true which I agree with you. So science could involve a lot of things that business administration may have, like there's less things to juggle. Yeah, yeah. So it's not who's right or who's wrong. The idea is uh, my perspective allows you to rationalize that you're right, but it doesn't stop you from also pursuing things that might be hard at first. Like this conversation, 
I, I imagine this conversation could be a little bit uncomfortable, but you did it. And the next time you talk about this topic, it's going to be easier, right? Because you have more experience with this conversation. And that's probably a secret objective of mine, too. Um, the more you discuss about these things, the more you share about these things with anyone you trust. Like, not a stranger online, by the way. Like, you don't have to rely on a stranger online. You can now, then, since you discussed this, you already practiced it. So the next time you have a conversation with someone else, you practiced it. It became easier. Just like decision making. Decision making, communication, most of your life skills. If you find a engaging way to just use it, you don't even have to be intellectually inclined. You can just intuit it. Your intuition takes over. So in the future, you can blow someone else's mind and pass it along, you know? Uh, the reason why I wanted to emphasize that is in the day of the internet, right? The glorious YouTube algorithm. The one thing that I worry about quite a lot is the idea that you see extraordinary people do extraordinary things without seeing literally how long it took them to do that or maybe how little they did, did that it's just part of the picture and oftentimes the word hard gets thrown around and nihilism is that idea like oh yeah this person is doing all that stuff that looks too hard and then that person never does anything right it's a big you might be thinking oh man that's a big leap like anything like it gets there it's a vicious cycle so if you want to learn about biology trust me i can there's a way to make it easily understandable without sacrificing how hard it is so what does a teacher do most of the time their goal is typically for parents or maybe some adult is to try to make something easier to understand while maintaining how objectively hard the content is. So I can probably say, maybe this is a weird flex. I would say I would be able to get you to understand very hard like topics in biology but make it feel easy to understand and when you begin to understand it biology no longer becomes hard like relatively speaking the material doesn't ever change how difficult it is right like the sciencey part like that part inherently will require certain skills but your perspective on how easy to understand gets easier and that's kind of like all this conversation like this stuff if you talk about I, I know like there's this maybe this multiculturalism uh multiculturalism uh can create like a bit of a stigma about sharing thoughts and feelings and whatnot but in the united states at least i feel it's a little open about this last question before you pass out do you plan to analyze your progress in some way or just come up in some sort of conclusion about learning etc i usually so um the things i do now which i haven't done all the time so uh, the current format that i do now is i start with opening remarks so i talk about what my plans are what i'm looking for what my motivations are and where the inspiration comes from right and then it's going to be all the videos in between. And then at the end, I will do a closing remark. And the closing remark is like all the things that stuck out to me that I'm keeping, uh, what I think about it, what have I learned, and all that stuff. And it's true about all the last like three or four games as well. So anything I do from now on follows that format. 
I will start with what knowledge and experience I bring in. Then is all the other videos. Then at the last video of all the games, it's the review process, right? So I'll talk about like the context, what things interest me, the social context, how it is as a design choice, what I learned about myself, that stuff comes at the end. So for this section, which I'm going to end today because I'm not going to do any more of this section. <laughs> um, uh, for this section, it's at the end of 31 days. So at the end of December, I have this little fun thing about talking about these things before the New Year's happen. So yes, I would say I do plan on it. Actually, it's part of the plan now. Um, it used to be not the case. So anything in the last like five or six games or projects, I have an opening remark and a closing remark. And it just me sitting here talking for six or seven hours with a with like a piece of paper. If you go and look at anything the first day of any of the new games, you'll see just a thumbnail of scribbles. Because I usually use like a art program to scribble my thoughts. And that used to be the most like thing that people enjoyed. So I that's what I'm doing now. And I'll do it at the, uh, I haven't decided if I'm going to do it at the end or not. But yeah, I hope that answers some questions. But again, don't ever be obligated to feel like you need to form a parasocial relationship with a stranger on the internet. Go through your life, make things happen. Bring those stories back and flex them. And that's kind of like, at least for me, I'm speaking personally. I definitely do not feel obligated. Like I, I usually don't see people for a while, like three months, six months, and then they bring back wonderful stories. Oh, you hope you'll be here the last day. Again, thank you. You can always look it up. It, it's, it's on the channel, so. You know, YouTube algo provides, right? You'll you'll see it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, best of luck with everything. Yeah, I I would love to hear what you ended up writing about for your bachelor's stuff. Yeah, good luck, man. And uh, sleep well. And uh, your last year. Yeah, I'm gonna end this segment here, actually. <laughs> I got another thing to do at the moment. Take care. Take care. It was a privilege and thank you for the kind words and the discussion.